Fallout 4 isn't a terrible game, but it's not a good one either. Fallout 4 was good enough to get a 3 out of 5 in my review, however it also makes me angry due to all the missed potential. Overall though, it's an okay game. I must admit though, I have more fun discussing what it does wrong than what it does right. Human nature I guess. Or my nature anyway. The combat is a huge improvement on previous Fallout games and the world looks damn impressive at times. When it all holds together that is. So why do I come down on Fallout 4 so hard? There are the bugs of course, and the dreadful conversation wheel, the perk system, the general lack of stat checks, however that all pales in comparison to the story which is simply dreadful. I couldn't find any concrete information on how much this game costs to make, but I don't believe for one minute that it costs less than $100 million. With all that money moving around I honestly don't understand how no one raised their hand in a meeting to point out that maybe, just maybe the game is based on an absolutely terrible premise that makes no sense. How does that happen with such a big production? I've no idea. Please, stop! Why did you say that name? It's his mother's name. It's his mother's name. The main excuse trotted out is that writing stories for games is hard, and it is. Executing a story in a game where some people just want to wander around and shoot stuff for 100 hours isn't easy, but that's no excuse for implementing something as utterly disastrous as the story in Fallout 4. After all, Fallout New Vegas did a much better job under the pressure of a short development cycle. I've had a few requests for a full video critique on Fallout 4, however there are a couple of great ones out there already and there wasn't much I could add to the conversation. For those of you who haven't seen them already, I highly recommend you spend 7 hours watching the two Fallout 4 videos by Joseph Anderson and the video by Mr. Caption. I'll link them in the description. In my Mass Effect Andromeda critique, I went through my biggest issues with the story and then decided to put forward my own ideas for how I would fix it. I've noticed that people often suggest improvements to the game mechanics or UI for example, but will often just criticise the story without saying what they would change. It probably comes across as incredibly arrogant, but that wasn't the intent. I did it to show how simple it can be to come up with a better story than the one contained in Andromeda. Judging by the comments, a fair few people seem to like this part of the video, although of course not everyone was so positive. I figured I'd do something similar with Fallout 4, so that's what this video is. It's an idea for Fallout 5. It's not a critique or a review. If you're subscribed to this channel for the critiques then I completely understand that this video isn't for you. This doesn't represent a change in the type of content I plan to do for the channel, it was just an idea floating around in my head and I needed a mental break after the Neo project. More critiques are coming soon, I promise. In this video I'm going to go over the major issues with Fallout 4's story and then put forward a completely new Fallout story that I believe manages to avoid the major pitfalls that Fallout 4 insisted on ploughing into at high speed. Just to be clear, in case it's not blindingly obvious already, I have no experience developing games or writing stories for games, I'm just trying to put my money where my mouth is. The footage in this video is random stuff from Fallout 4 because obviously I can't use footage from Fallout 5. Most of it is pretty bad as I hadn't played the game for a while when recording this b-roll, I even forgot how to throw a grenade at one point. I've prepared some flowcharts and the like to help you follow along with my points because I go all over the place at times. My proposed story has quite a few different threads and it can get messy. There are links in the description to separate files with these images if you'd rather follow along on a separate browser window. I intend to make this as easy to follow as possible with just my words, but some people find visual aids easier. It's there if you want it. I'll bring them up on screen as well, but it can be tricky to read, especially if you're on a phone. Before I get stuck into my idea for Fallout 5, let's look at what exactly was wrong with Fallout 4. Just the story stuff, I don't want to keep you here all day. I'm going to assume you've already played Fallout 4, but if not, the spoilers are about to begin. Right at the start of Fallout 4 you enter a vault with your wife and young child, or husband and young child if you played as a woman. You enter a vault just as the bombs are dropping and somehow don't get blinded and covered in third degree burns from the nuclear blast that takes place nearby. You're cryogenically frozen but you get woken up to see your child kidnapped and your spouse murdered. And there's your goal for the entire game, rescue your kidnapped son. It's a simple premise but there's nothing wrong with a simple premise. The problem is that once you get out into the open world you're encouraged to start building settlements and helping goddamn Preston Garvey with his Minutemen bullshit. Every time you undertake a side quest you're wasting time that should be spent hunting for your child. It's a huge problem and not one I need to spend a lot of time on. Basically there's a huge disconnect between the player and the character. Your character will want to do everything he can to find his son, however the player probably won't care because you've only seen the baby as a random blob that you've not interacted with and it's more fun to explore the wasteland, complete side quests and build your own story. My own playthrough illustrated this problem perfectly. I still hadn't completed Fallout 4 when the DLC came out. I had the season pass and downloaded the Far Harbor DLC without thinking about it. This Far Harbor DLC has you going to Maine to search for someone else's missing daughter who thinks she might be a synth. 
I spent about 10 hours doing the Far Harbour DLC. That's 10 hours looking for someone else's kid while my own was still missing. There's a couple of ways to deal with this disconnect. You might be able to get the player to care in the same way as the character by having them actually spend some time with the child, however that's still tricky in an open world game that encourages exploration. Another option which is rarely used these days is a timer like the one in the original Fallout. Again, that would go against a lot of what Bethesda is trying to achieve with its games. Finally there is the New Vegas approach where you have a mystery that both the player and the character might want to solve but which doesn't have any degree of urgency or importance attached to it. If you don't want to find out why you were left for dead, you don't have to, and the player and the character motivations are easily reconciled. Fallout 4's introduction contains another major problem and that's the forced backstory. There's two parts to this. One I can forgive and the other I can't. The forgivable part is that you have to be married with a child. Clearly once the writers settled on a story about rescuing your child, there needed to be a kid involved. A spouse is understandable, although I would argue that it would be cool for players to choose their sexuality before the game starts. My bigger issue is that the game forces a backstory on you. The husband is a former soldier and the wife is a former lawyer. That's it, you can't swap, so if you play as the woman then you're a gun-toting lawyer trying to survive the wasteland. I'm speaking from experience when I say that most lawyers would not survive these conditions. Our idea of a long trek through the wilderness is when we get to work late and can't park our car as close to the office as we'd like. I don't necessarily think players should have complete freedom in crafting backstories for their characters because it becomes tough to create a story at all otherwise. Even in New Vegas you know you're a mailman at the start. However, due to the memory loss you have complete freedom to start fresh as a new man and make sense of any build you like. In Fallout 4 you might have to pretend you're a lawyer who has such low intelligence she can't spell lawsuit let alone fire one or a soldier who is so bad with guns that he doesn't know which end to use. The rest of my complaints are in no particular order. Fallout 4's factions were boring and didn't have any consequence of note until near the end. You can work for all of the factions until a splitting point when you have to choose. As an example, near the end of the Brotherhood of Steel questline you have to attack a building to get a part you need for Liberty Prime. You have to defeat lots of the Institute synths as you head down the building. I did this on my first playthrough and then chose the Institute route the next time. I expected to be doing the same mission from the other side, defending the building instead of attacking it, but no, that's not what happened. The mission was exactly the same except I was killing Brotherhood of Steel members instead of synths. The factions were simply an excuse to have players push through the narrative, they were a means to an end. You had to choose one to complete the game, but you never really felt like a member of one. Speaking of which, Bethesda needs to stop making players the leader of factions within 5 minutes of introducing yourself, and you shouldn't be able to lead multiple contradictory factions. First, it's not believable, even in the context of far-fetched stories, that you would be put in charge of a group like the Railroad just by showing up at their base and doing a few basic tasks. Second, it's not much of a reward for the same reason. There's no feeling of satisfaction or that you've earned it. You can lead the Railroad, Institute and Minutemen without needing any particular skill set. You don't need intelligence to lead the Institute. You don't need combat skills to lead the Minutemen. You just need to be the protagonist, any protagonist. Finally, and I think this is most important, there's no benefit to being the leader of a faction. You're head of the Minutemen for what purpose? You can increase the number of settlements, but you could do that anyway. You don't need to be the leader to do that. Likewise with the Railroad, you never act as a leader. If you side with them then you get their ending, but you don't lead the group, it's absolutely pointless. The ease with which you could become leader of the factions was always one of my bigger gripes with the game, however I guess in 2017 the thought of someone coming out of nowhere and becoming leader of a group with no experience doesn't seem quite so far-fetched anymore. This is more tangential to the story, but the lack of speech and intelligence checks in Fallout 4 really bothered me. Being charismatic or intelligent isn't rewarded beyond a few additional but largely pointless dialogue options and some extra XP. If my character is intelligent, I want to feel intelligent and have that intelligence reflected in my story. Going back to the factions, intelligence should have been a factor when talking to people in the Institute for example. They're a clever bunch of scientists, but they'll take orders from a dribbling idiot without hesitation. That's just not realist… oh, yeah. Fallout 4's version of Boston looks damn impressive at times, and there are small examples of world building and storytelling, however the environment as a whole isn't believable. You leave the vault about 250 years after the bombs fell, but very few of the towns have been rebuilt. There's still rubbish littering the streets, and there are plenty of empty houses despite people needing homes. Diamond City is at least vaguely presentable, but the rest of Boston feels like it hasn't been touched in the entire 250 year period. With regards to the settlements, this was probably a deliberate decision to allow the player to create their own settlements using the game's new building system, but that doesn't excuse the rest of the city. Finally, it's always best to avoid gaping plot holes if you can. 
I'm not talking about inconsistencies with the law or minor side quests. I'm talking about huge issues that make no sense, like why did Kellogg kill your wife at the beginning when it was clearly unnecessary? And why did Shaw not rescue his dad later on instead of letting him wander the wasteland in the vague hope of finding him? In fact, nearly everything surrounding Father and Kellogg is a plot hole that the writers try to wave away with flimsy excuses or messages in terminals that feel like they were added at the last minute. New Vegas avoids a lot of Fallout Force problems, but I should admit up front that New Vegas has its issues as well. One reason likely particular to me is that I'm not a huge fan of the Wild West vibe. I don't watch westerns, just not my thing. Fallout is set in a dystopian future, but it is the future and it is a world in which there are energy weapons. I would like to see a little more sci-fi slip into the world. Similarly, the story almost goes a little too far in the other direction from Fallout 3. Factions are not just important to the story in New Vegas, they are the story. The fight over the Hoover Dam just wasn't all that exciting to me. Before cracking on with my proposed Fallout 5, it's worth setting some limits on what I can do with the story so that I keep things vaguely realistic. I'm going to lay some ground rules so that I don't get carried away. I don't mean safe words and the like, I mean rules for keeping the story realistic within the confines of how I understand video game development and what I care about in a Fallout game. The obvious one is cost. It's all well and good coming up with huge stories and dream locations, but video games cost money to make and even though Fallout 5 will rake in money, there are limits on how much Bethesda game studios can spend on developing it. The world I propose in Fallout 5 won't necessarily be any bigger than that of Fallout 4, so in that respect it's a realistic proposal. Of course, if Bethesda wants to make it bigger, then that's great. The main problem I anticipate is additional writing and voice acting, because the choices I propose will necessitate more dialogue. I don't want to gloss over this, but I also don't want to pretend that this is the biggest cost of game development, because it's not. 20% more writing does not increase the cost of development by 20%, and to be honest, given the amount of money these games bring in, I don't think a small cost increase is unreasonable anyway. More controversially, I'm not all that obsessed with Fallout's lore. To me, Fallout games are about leaving a vault and entering a post-nuclear world to create your own story. Some repeated elements like caps and power armor are worth keeping, but I don't need to see the Brotherhood of Steel in every game. It's perfectly possible to set a Fallout game in a location without them. Fallout games are about survival and freedom, they're not about what model of power armor the characters are wearing. Near the start of my proposed story you'll notice a huge difference that may have many of you clicking away in disgust. That's fine, I get why some people want 100% consistency, but I'm much more concerned with staying true to what makes Fallout games great as opposed to the details that featured in those games. My proposed story will be shorter than that of Fallout 4, but will vary depending on what choices you make. Discussing game length for open experiences like this is always tricky, but I'd say that Fallout 4 is a 40 hour game for most people, if not longer. I'd like Fallout 5 to be a 25 hour experience for most players, but one that people will want to play at least twice, if not three times. Character creation will be done right at the beginning on a menu before you even start playing the game. You'll design your character in the usual way. I prefer the skill system to the perk system, but I'm not getting into that here. This point might seem a little odd, but I'm also going to have players select their sexuality up front. There's a story reason for this that will become clear at the end, however I think it makes sense by itself. I know what you might be thinking. If you're anything like me, you don't decide your character's sexuality at the beginning. You wait to see who you meet along the way, and then make a decision based on whoever tickles your fancy. Forcing players to choose a sexuality eliminates romance options and seems somewhat limiting in a game that's supposed to be all about freedom. Here's the thing though, if your character is choosing relationships in a gender neutral manner until he or she meets someone they like, then I have news for you. Your character is bisexual. I hope that doesn't come as too much of a shock. I'm sure your parents will understand. Finally, and likely most controversially, Fallout 5 will have an ending. I know, shocking right? How dare a story end? Ok, I get there are people out there who want to keep wandering the wasteland, so I'm going to give them an out. You'll see what I mean when we get there, but there will be a logical way to continue playing after the end of the story if that's really what you want to do. Let's be honest, you'll only go and mod it in anyway, so I might as well include it in the design. My story is not perfect, far from it. There are cliches, including a big one right at the beginning, and a slow start that won't be to everyone's taste. It's also vague in places, and I don't attempt to describe every interaction the player might have. This is a detailed outline, but nothing more. I borrow a lot from New Vegas with the opening and the focus on factions, however it's more futuristic and takes place in a more varied world. And with those caveats out of the way, let's begin in the cheesiest way possible. The screen starts black. There's a banging noise and people are shouting something inaudible. Your character opens his or her eyes and sits up before slowly focusing on their surroundings. I'm going to refer to my character as male from here on out. You see a sign on the wall, vault number 957 or whatever, the number isn't important. Vault 420 or vault 69 if you like, go nuts. The banging continues except now you can hear that it's coming from a door on your left. People are yelling at you to open the door. 
You stand up and head towards the door which you're about to open when you notice your blood soaked hands. You panic and notice the dead body lying on the floor in a pool of blood. You don't remember who you are or how you got here. I told you it'd be cliche. You don't have much time. The people outside get the door open and burst in. They're all wearing security uniforms and armed with batons. They scream at you and demand you surrender. Here's where the first set of choices comes in. You can surrender and be arrested. You can attempt to fight but you will fail. You're outnumbered and unarmed. You can run but you will probably be caught. I say probably because I intend it to be possible to escape the vault but you would have to know what you're doing. This shouldn't be something that players can manage on their first playthrough unless they've looked it up online. This is another thing that will make more sense later but the point is that the player will be able to escape but they probably won't. Most players will be caught and the game will skip to a hastily arranged trial. You'll be asked questions but it won't be possible to avoid a conviction. You were literally caught red handed and are found guilty. Punishment is exile from the vault to spend the rest of your life in a labour camp on the wasteland. After the trial you're led to the vault's exit however on the way you might have a quick conversation with other vault dwellers who sympathise with you. This bit depends on how you responded during the trial and in turn on your character's build. If you're intelligent perhaps you're able to convince the scientist on the jury that you're innocent and he sneaks you a piece of useful equipment before you're exiled. If you're aggressive you might impress the tough military type and so on. Or maybe you don't impress anyone and you're exiled empty handed. I don't intend for this to be a huge and significant part of the game, it's just there to show players that their build and response to dialogue options does matter. It's just going to be a couple of health packs or some food. The vault door opens but instead of walking out into the open air you step forward into a corridor and are then forced into a small pod. You're strapped into a chair and the door closes. You wait for a few seconds while alarms sound and then the pod shoots down a tube and out into the open expanse of space. So yeah, this is the bit where I probably lose a lot of Fallout fans but this vault is actually a space station and the pod is sending your character back to the wasteland that is Earth where the prison facilities are located and life isn't quite so comfortable. Now I know this brings up some issues with lore. As far as I know there's never been any mention of a space station of this type in previous games nor any sightings of a large space station in Earth's orbit. Like I said, I'm not a slave to the lore and this is what I want to do in the story. Take it for what it's worth. If you're worried about the cost of developing a space station for the game, well I'd argue that it would function a lot like the Institute in Fallout 4 so it doesn't need to be a huge extra drain on the development resources. You land on Earth where there is a security force waiting for you. I'll call this security force the Earth Security Force, the ESF. The ESF works for the group on the space station vault. If you managed to escape during the opening then you made it to the pod by yourself and landed on Earth without the armed welcome party. Once again you're given a choice and this time it will have a pretty significant impact on your story. You can successfully escape from the ESF either by running or fighting and winning. This is intended to be a lot easier than last time. If you fight there's a decent chance you'll get a weapon from one of the guards and you'll be able to fight them off. Running is easier as you're now out in the open instead of in a cramped vault. If you successfully escape then you will initially be placed on what I'm referring to as the solo route of the story. If you either surrender or fail to escape by running or fighting then you will be imprisoned by the earth security force and live in squalid conditions. Most people will be on this route on their first playthrough. I haven't decided exactly how this prison sequence should work. I'm leaning towards a system where you're forced to do basic chores but there are lots of fade to black so you don't actually spend hours peeling potatoes. You'll get opportunities to prove yourself to sympathetic people within the ESF. For example if you're intelligent you might be able to help an ESF technician get into a locked computer. If you're strong you might help security put down a riot or you could use the riot to escape. If you escape you're back onto the solo route that I mentioned earlier. You can stay in prison for as long as you like but the game will offer you plenty of contrived opportunities to help out the technology team or get your hands dirty with the security force. These choices are obviously more limiting than I'd like but I have to be realistic about how many options there can be. Joining the security force will be a fallback option and there will be plenty of ways to get friendly with members of the ESF who then agree to let you join their ranks. It won't be as easy to join the tech team especially if your character isn't intelligent. However there could be other ways to make the right connections like planting listing devices or doing a bit of spying for them. I've now mentioned three of the routes you can take through the game, solo, tech and security. There's one more but first I'll explain the solo route a bit more. If you escape prison yourself or don't get caught in the first place, you won't be aligned with any particular route. You're free to live your life in the wasteland how you see fit. You can do chores for people, earn money, maybe even buy a house eventually. You have to earn or steal caps to pay for your rad x meds which will be essential. Without meds you'll eventually get sick and die from radiation poisoning. I don't envision this route being particularly exciting. It will consist of fetch quests and likely some of the dreaded radiant quests to keep things moving along. There will be small towns with bars and other gathering points so you can meet people and get married. There should be some mini games like poker and darts to play. The settlement system from Fallout 4 can be brought in however it should be much harder to build places. 
Building a home should feel like a real achievement. This scenario should be developed as much as is realistically possible, however, this is very much the fourth choice in terms of routes. This is for people who like the settlement system in Fallout 4 and don't want to do any kind of story. If we want to get really ambitious, this route could have an online mode where you join up with other players to complete quests and raids. While you are on the solo route, you will bump into a group of outlaws who you can join up with. This will be the outlaw route. Players will also have one more chance to join up with the tech route or the security route, so even if they ran away at the beginning, they can still join up. We can ignore the solo route for most of this video, so that leaves outlaw, tech and security. I'm calling them routes, but you can think of them as factions if you like. I've provided flowcharts for each of these routes if you're following along at home. Before going down these separate routes, it's worth spending a few minutes discussing the world itself, because that's one of the things I criticised in Fallout 4. The world will be in three parts in the form of concentric circles. The middle circle will be a relatively well developed area, by the standards of post-nuclear wastelands anyway. Ideally there will be a couple of large buildings and a more modern feel than anything we've seen in Fallout games before. As you get closer to the edge of the first circle, the large sophisticated buildings will give way to small towns with little farms, bars and shops. This bit will be similar to Fallout 4 but perhaps better developed. Think of lots of diamond cities. At the edge of this middle circle is a mixture of wall and fencing that is well guarded to stop anyone getting in or out without permission. Within this middle circle you will rarely be at risk of attack from the typical assortment of radiated monstrosities, however the odd beast may get in. You can also get into fights with humans who are causing trouble or trying to stop you from causing trouble. The second circle is a lot rougher, it's the slums. People live here including the aforementioned outlaws, however the houses are of poor quality and people will be attacked by mutants and all manner of beasts. There's a certain degree of safety in numbers, but you'll still have to sleep with one eye open. The people out here are able to grow certain crops and they trade those crops with people in the middle circle, however they are rarely allowed into that area themselves. They're typically exiles who are banished as punishment never to return. The final circle is the really dangerous area. Think of this as the glowing sea in Fallout 4. If you need to venture into this zone then you should be armed to the teeth, equipped with Radaway and power armour or very good at avoiding combat. This area is dangerous. I'm hoping that this game world avoids some of the problems with world building in Fallout 4. I always thought it was a bit odd that violent ghouls would live right next to population centres without anyone doing anything about it. A more realistic setup is a populated area with the wilderness around it. The populated area should be relatively clean and tidy with all the danger located on the outskirts. For the most part everything in this world functions about as well as it could in the circumstances. The ESF collects taxes in the form of a percentage of crops and food produced. In return the ESF keeps everyone safe from raiders, ghouls and the like that are outside the town and provides the radix that people need to survive. Part of the food collected is sent up to the space station vault in exchange for the radix pills that can only be made on the space station vault. There's a basic shuttle system that allows the ESF to send food up to the space station, or you can think of it as a space elevator if you like. That's it at a very basic level, but you might have noticed there's not much of a story so far. That's where we move on to the second act, which will be different depending on the route you choose. Your character is never assigned a motivation as such. If you don't want to progress the narrative, then you don't have to. However, I'm hoping that the player will be curious about what happened on board the space station and maybe want to get back up there to find out who you are and what you did. You can stay on Earth if you like, but that space station will always be overhead, let's pretend it's in geosequinous orbit, so it will taunt the player until they tackle the main quest. Let's start by looking at what happens if you get recruited by the tech guys while you are locked up. You're broken out of prison, or maybe bought out if you're valuable, and invited to join a group of highly intelligent individuals who want to build their own space station. Oh, and they're ghouls. In Fallout lore, ghouls have typically been discriminated against and often used as bullet fodder enemies. Non-feral ghouls are typically as intelligent as normal humans except they live a lot longer and are sterile. With this story I figured it would be cool if the ghouls were far more intelligent than humans, after all their longer lifespan would allow them to acquire more knowledge. It would be nice for the ghouls to have a positive attribute that offsets their somewhat grotesque nature. This group operates independently from the ESF because as ghouls they don't have to worry about radiation and therefore don't need the radix that is a huge part of the economy and the reason why the ESF is in charge of most people. The ghouls allow you to join up and you'll do basic quests for the group. For example you could go deep into the radiation zone to test equipment, fetch quests etc. I'd like there to be flexibility in how you accomplish these missions. Going in all guns blazing is the obvious route but there should be options to do things in a way that takes advantage of your intelligence. For example, the tech base could be raided. You could take up arms and fight them off, or you could set off traps, lock them in rooms, disable their weapons, and so on. That's more of a gameplay thing than a story thing, so I won't go into that too much. The ghouls promise that if they manage to build a space station, they will help you figure out what happened to you on your vault. 
I'd like to think that the prospect of creating a new space station is enough to motivate players to continue. After proving your worth, you're approached by an individual who represents a group of ghouls that don't want to build their own space station. They want to use their superior intelligence to take over Earth instead. They believe they're the next step in the evolution of humanity and want to claim their rightful place at the top of the pile instead of being looked down on. As an added extra, perhaps they've uncovered a way to reproduce and plan to start asserting their dominance. If you want to get really creative, then perhaps they offer you the opportunity to become a ghoul yourself with a nice intelligence boost to go along with it. Taking a step back, all of the routes are going to have an alternative quest like this. Just because your character's intelligent doesn't mean he's a good person. Just because he's tough and can handle himself doesn't mean he's an arsehole. While each route has a main option for the story, you'll be able to take a different side if you want. So there's a default and an alternative subroute. In the case of the tech route, the default is being a good person, but you can be a jerk too if you want. Okay, so at this point we've joined a faction of sorts and done some tasks for them. Of course, while out on those tasks, there's nothing stopping you from helping people in need. The extra resources might come in useful. We've reached the midpoint of the story when something big happens to spur things forward. This is something Fallout 4 lacked. Information about your son just sort of trickled out as you got closer to uncovering the story. There's no clear three-act structure. For reference, the midpoint typically falls in the middle of the story to break up the second act, which tends to be the longest. The midpoint is sometimes the point of no return, but it doesn't have to be. It's often just upping the stakes. For example, in Star Wars, the midpoint is when the Millennium Falcon gets caught in the Death Star tractor beam after Tarkin has ordered Leia's death and Han has discovered that Alderaan isn't where it's supposed to be. Everything has gone to shit, but it doesn't have to be that drastic. Anyway, the midpoint to my story is an explosion on board the space station. It's large enough to be seen from Earth, but not large enough to take out the entire station. This midpoint is going to be the same for each of the routes, however the events from here to the final act will be slightly different. The ghouls try to contact the space station, but they can't get through. Even though the ghouls have no relationship with those on board the station, they decide to launch a rocket early in an attempt to help. While their space station isn't ready, they are capable of going into space with just a few extra pieces of gear needed, which of course you will go out and get. Maybe you also need to rescue an important scientist who has been missing for a while and manages to send out a rescue signal. There's lots of ways this can be done to expand on the basic fetch quest structure. Use your imagination. Once the rocket is ready, you're asked to be part of the crew because you have knowledge of the space station. Not a lot of knowledge because you've lost your memory, but some. Of course, you might not want to help the ghouls. You might have decided to join the bad bunch who want to take over the Earth. Well, they also want to go into space, but they'd quite like to turn the mission into a takeover of the space station instead of a rescue. It's seen as a valuable asset and would in theory help them establish ghouls as a power on Earth. The second act ends as the rocket heads into space. The third act is similar for all routes, so let's go back and see what happens on the security route. The job of the ESF is to keep everything running smoothly. If their little section of Earth operates properly, then the people on the space station are able to make the meds which they send down to Earth, while the ESF uses the meds to collect food and resources which are sent to space. It's all a lovely little circle. When you get thrown in with the ESF, you'll join a crew that is a little power crazed. They carry weapons and aren't afraid to keep the odd bit of profit for themselves. You'll go on rounds and gradually be initiated into the shadier side of proceedings. You'll hand out rad X drugs and deal with any problems that arise. If you have good charisma, you might be able to exhort a little extra and get a promotion. Or maybe you can avoid confrontation when not necessary. Or maybe you don't care if a few people accidentally end up dead. It's up to you. Once again, we'll need some excuses to go out into the dangerous parts of the world, but that's easy enough when your job is officially to keep people safe. Everyone in the ESF wants to do a good job and keep the higher-ups happy because there's a reward system in place. Those who perform well are occasionally recruited to live and work on the space station. It happens often enough that it's seen as a tangible reward to aim for. As with the technology route, you'll be offered the chance to do something a little different if you don't want to follow the default route. In this case, you can join a minority within the ESF who think there's a conspiracy to uncover. You won't get much information about it immediately and you'll only be offered this opportunity if you've broadly behaved yourself. This is a chance to use your strength and combat skills for the greater good. We reach the midpoint and part of the space station explodes. If you're on the main path, you are part of the group that receives a distress call from the space station. The people on the space station need help. I propose a few variants for what could happen next. There's no way for the ESF to send a crew up to the space station because they only have a single shuttle which is tiny and only fits a couple of people. It's meant for transporting food, not large groups. Fortunately, the ESF gets word of a shuttle nearby at the tech center. You can either attack the group, sneak inside, or perhaps convince them to let you take one of their shuttles if you have high charisma. If you took the alternative subroute, you will use the commotion following the midpoint to investigate a conspiracy within your ranks. You discover that the most recent batch of Rad X is fake. 
They aren't anti-radiation meds at all and everyone is going to start getting sick soon if they don't get real meds. This gives you the same desire to get to the space station as before. You can tell the tech group what you found and they might let you join their mission or you can try to take the ship by sneaking in. This group won't want to use force if they don't have to. And that's the end of the second act for the security route. Once again you're on a shuttle heading to the space station. The third route is the outlaw route. As you might guess from the name this is a ragtag group who are separate from main society. They live in the slums and are just fighting to survive. This is the least prosperous group of the bunch by a long way and the experience with them is probably the closest to a traditional fallout adventure. The group is a little eccentric and paranoid. They're convinced that the ESF is working against the population as a whole and keeping everyone suppressed. Their main quest is a bit like the alternative quest with the ESF where you investigate a conspiracy relating to the Rad X. This is being kept deliberately similar to avoid having to create too many separate locations and stories. You work with the group to gather evidence of the ESF's wrongdoing. Then the midpoint happens with part of the space station exploding. The outlaws decide to use this as an opportunity to go digging just like the other group did earlier. They could even be working together if you like. As with the other routes you need an option to do something a little different and in this case it will be causing trouble. Some of the outlaws are not so concerned with the conspiracy and just want to be violent and chaotic. Fallout 4 lacked options for role playing as a bad guy and didn't really end up fixing that until the Nuka World DLC. This should provide that option. After the midpoint the main outlaw group discover a link between the Radix supplies and the people on board the space station and decide to head up there themselves. Being a good bunch they attempt to work with the ghouls at the tech centre and because you attempt to cooperate the ghouls will likely let you on unless you have incredibly low intelligence and charisma. If you're doing the minority route then you'll just stay on earth and use the commotion to rob and kill. At this point each of the three routes has reached the end of the second act and is approaching the finale. The finale will have a lot in common with each route in terms of the mechanics of what happens next, however you will have more choices to make that should ensure at least two completely different playthroughs. Before you take off and head to the space station there will be a clear warning to let players know they won't be returning to earth anytime soon. Freedom will be restricted from this point. Whatever route you've chosen, chances are you'll be on a shuttle heading to the space station vault that is still recovering from the explosion. As you get closer you notice that the explosion only affected a separate module and therefore the rest of the space station is not in immediate danger. Your initial introduction to the space station is a little anticlimactic. Even if you're with one of the groups that is suspicious of the people on the space station you can't just come on board and attack. You're met by a large squad and scuttled away into a quarantine facility or something like that. Then you get the final big choice of the game. You and the rest of your faction are approached by a member of a rebellion on board the space station and they want your help when shit goes down. I'll refer to this group as the rebels. They're the ones who caused the explosion on board the space station in the first place. After that a member of the ruling group on board the space station explains that the situation is tense and they might need your help. You're told that perhaps if you were to help them out they might let you stay. These are the elites. You have to choose who you side with, the rebels or the elites. The group you're working with will influence your decision. For example if you're with the main ESF route the group will want to support the elites as they are loyal. You'll have freedom over what you do but if you go against your group then you will find yourself with less support unless you can use your charisma to convince them to your way of thinking. The final battle breaks out. I expect most players will choose the rebels on board the space station so they'll be fighting against the odds. I envision this being a bit like the battle at the institute in Fallout 4. Losing the battle could be a game over or mean you're exiled to earth, I haven't decided. Assuming you win you'll find out what happened on board the space station that fateful day when you woke up with blood on your hands and a dead body in the room. You're shown the truth via a security camera recording. I know, not original. I never promised originality. So what do you see on the camera footage? This is controversial and it won't be easy to pull off. If it works I think it's quite cool. My proposal is that the reason your character woke up with blood on his hands will vary depending on what sort of person your character proved himself to be during the main game. In other words there's no fixed beginning. We're used to our actions affecting the end of a story so I figured it would be interesting if they affected the beginning instead. Let's work through an example. Imagine you joined the technology group, stuck to the main quest and then helped out the rebels on board the space station. You've proved yourself to be an intelligent and all round good person. In this case your ending, or rather your beginning, will be footage of you using a computer terminal in the room you woke up in right back at the beginning of the game. The person who you were accused of killing is working at a terminal next to you. There's a few shots of you talking to him or her but they're also looking around a lot paranoid about being caught. Neither of you should be in here. A couple of people burst in and attack both of you. The other person is killed and you watch yourself get beaten and framed for the murder. In addition to this footage there's emails of people agreeing to frame you for murder to make the problem go away. There's a reason for all these shady goings on. 
you were investigating something important and were about to unravel a big conspiracy. Before getting into that, let's look at what might happen if you were a less upstanding citizen during the game. There obviously has to be a limit on the number of endings you can have, but I think we can get in five distinct ones without it requiring a ridiculous amount of work. I'll put these up on screen and move through them quickly. I don't intend for these options to be as black and white as they sound, but for sake of moving through quickly, let's keep to the basics. If you're an intelligent character but one with bad morals, then you're going to be one of the people behind the conspiracy. The victim caught you out and confronted you. There was a fight and you killed him or her. So you actually are guilty. If you're bad and dumb, then you could be a grunt who's sent to deal with the problem. Again, you murder this other person in cold blood. If your morals are moderate, neither good nor bad, but you're clever, then you're investigating the scheme and the victim catches you in the act. However, the death is an accident in the fight. If you're dumb with moderate morals, then once again you're just a pawn in the scheme and you kill the victim by accident. This is modelled based on the old school, lawful, neutral, chaotic, good, neutral, evil alignment in RPGs with some tweaks. The next scene is another slightly cliche moment where your character regains some of his memories, the most important of which being the realisation that the dead person from the beginning of the game is in fact your spouse. That's why it's important to pick your sexuality right at the start, because it'd be weird if your gay male character was previously married to a woman. And yes, this person is your spouse regardless of whether you killed them in cold blood or not. All that's left to reveal is the mystery behind the conspiracy you were either about to unravel or protect. Again, I make no claim that this is particularly original. I don't think Fallout needs some mind-blowing piece of creativity to make it work. Simplicity is often the best approach in situations like this one. As we know from previous Fallout games, the vaults are typically much more than just a place for people to hide out in and escape the nuclear wasteland. They're often social experiments, such as putting a load of gamblers together to see what happens or torturing children to tough them up for the wasteland. In this case, the space station vault was designed to be the safety net of the richest and most powerful people on Earth at the time of the nuclear war. The vault appears to be a working capitalist democracy, albeit a small one. However, everything is a sham designed to keep the rich people and their descendants in power forever. Elections are faked and courts are rigged, all that lovely stuff. There's just one problem. In the rush to get the vault up and running, there wasn't time to get the station properly self-sufficient. Not all of the food grown on Earth can be grown on the space station, and spare parts often need to be sent into space for maintenance purposes. That makes the space station incredibly reliant on people on the ground. Therefore, the elites pretended to invent Rad-X, a drug that supposedly keeps people from getting radiation sickness and eventually dying. Except that's not what Rad-X does. It's a drug that gives users a slight energy boost to convince them it's working. However, it also has extreme withdrawal symptoms that are so bad your body might go into shock and you might die if you stop taking the drug for any period of time. This ensures that people on Earth continue to believe in the need for Rad-X drugs even though they aren't actually necessary. Remember all those people from the ESF who got promoted to the space station? They're living miserable lives as slaves serving the elites. The promotions were all part of the scheme to keep the ESF in check down on Earth. There could be clues to this situation on Earth for players to find, maybe coded messages from people on the space station pleading for help, that kind of thing. The resolution to the story is a little tricky to explain because of all the possible options, but I'll take a stab at it. Let's first imagine you sided with the elites in the big battle. They'll want life to carry on as before. You can agree and stay on board the space station. This should be an ending, so a montage will play out where you'll see your character living the rest of their life in the vault. There would be some variation in the slides depending on your character and choices. Your character might be happy as one of the elites, or they might be miserable. It doesn't matter too much. These slides are supposed to be a nice final touch to cap off the experience, but I don't expect players to replay the game just to see different slides. And what if you sided with the rebels on board the space station? The rebels want to blow the conspiracy wide open. After all, that's what they fought for. However, in some cases that might not be what you fought for. For example, if you took the alternative tech route, the group might want to use the Radex conspiracy to its advantage to slowly take over Earth for the ghouls. That's not going to be the case in most playthroughs, and typically your group will want to end the distribution of Radex on Earth. If you don't want to go along with that, you can refuse. You might be able to convince the group to your way of thinking if you've earned their loyalty or have high charisma. If you really stick to your guns and can't agree what to do, then you'll be exiled from the station once again and forced to live the rest of your life on Earth. There will be variations on these endings, but that's the gist of it. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that my version of Fallout 5 wouldn't have to end if you didn't want it to. To keep all players happy, your character can opt to leave the space station and head back to Earth to join what I earlier referred to as the solo route. You can do quests, play games at the bar, meet a spouse, etc. You shouldn't do this, you should start the game again and do a different route, but if you want to spend the rest of your life doing Radiant quests, then you can. You've got the gist at this point. While writing this script, it's tough to know how easy that is to follow while watching or listening to a video. Hopefully the diagrams helped a bit, but I appreciate that it all sounds a little convoluted. And with my version of the story over, let's go back and see if it deals with Fallout 4's biggest issues.
These are my biggest problems with Fallout 4's story. Let's see if my proposed story deals with these problems. Fallout 4's biggest problem was its disconnect between player and character motivation, where your character is supposed to be hunting for his son, whereas the player doesn't really care all that much and might spend hundreds of hours doing random crap. This issue might sound small, but it bleeds through into the entire experience. The game expects the player to care as much as the character, and that's unlikely to be the case. I believe my proposal deals with this problem while still giving players an actual story to follow if they want one. The character won't have a burning desire to go back to the station or even to think it's a possibility. If you as a player want to ignore it, you can. If you want to find out who framed you, then you can push the matter further. One of the routes has you ignoring the story altogether, and while I envision this being a little boring, it is at least an option that can be consistent with the character's motivations. There's a potential disconnect after the midpoint explosion. At this stage, the various groups and subgroups want your help to build or steal a shuttle, and there might be the illusion of time pressure at this stage. Still, if you don't want to help them, that's entirely your choice. It doesn't need to feel like a glaring inconsistency like deciding not to find your kidnapped son. Obviously, once you're in the final act on board the space station, the player's freedom is diminished significantly until they see out the ending. With an appropriate warning beforehand, I don't see that being a huge problem. The second problem was Fallout 4's forced backstory. This is one I've partly dealt with, but only partly. You're not forced to be anything specific like a soldier or lawyer, however the way the game ends does force a certain backstory on the player which they may not like, especially as they're not told it until the end. I don't believe this is a huge problem for two reasons. First, you have memory loss at the beginning, so the player probably shouldn't be creating a huge backstory for their character anyway because the character doesn't know who he is. Second, the partial backstory that is revealed at the end of the game should be vaguely consistent with who you were as a character during the game. Still, it has to be said this is the sort of decision that can piss people off. Overall, I think it's interesting, but others will hate it. Third, in Fallout 4 the factions didn't feel different enough in their quest, despite their different motivations. You could join multiple factions, and the only choice is a late game decision that doesn't change the way you play the game for most of your journey. In Fallout 4, Brotherhood of Steel, the Railroad and the Minutemen are basically the same. They have different motivations, but their quests are always about going to places and shooting things. Neither faction rewards charisma or intelligence, not even the Institute. In my Fallout 5 proposal, there are at least two drastically different faction types, and maybe even three. The Tech faction is clearly different to the ESF and the Outlaws. I'd also argue the Outlaws are sufficiently different from the ESF, because the Outlaws are a small group attempting to infiltrate the large security force and will therefore be underpowered, whereas the ESF is far more powerful and feels a bit like a bully at times. I appreciate you could apply similar labels to the Brotherhood of Steel versus the Railroad, but those groups never felt different in their implementation. The Brotherhood has power armour, but you can use high level power armour yourself within the Railroad. They never felt underpowered against the Brotherhood, even though they should have been. In this proposed Fallout 5 story, your choice of faction drastically changes your perspective around missions from the early stages. Now, to keep costs realistic, I had the faction stories overlap and end in a similar way, however I would hope the writing is strong enough to make you feel like part of a unique faction instead of just being surrounded by a different type of AI working alongside you. The factions would also gravitate towards different weapons. The tech group would use energy weapons and try to avoid direct combat, the ESF would be well equipped with armour and assault rifles, while the outlaws would use whatever they could get their hands on. Fourth, there's the issue of being promoted to leader of a faction without good reason. In my story, you can become leader of the group that heads up to the space station if you take your time and earn their trust and confidence, but most people likely won't. It won't be easy to achieve. Fifth, your stats should matter again. I've highlighted some speech and intelligence checks at various points in the story, but this is the sort of thing that needs to pop up more often in both main quests and side quests. Sixth, the world in this proposed Fallout 5 is more varied than Boston in Fallout 4. It's crazy that a facility as developed as the Institute exists underneath an area that has 250 year old rubbish lying around. It's beautiful in places and at times it feels hauntingly real, but you never go more than 20 minutes without being reminded that this version of Boston hasn't had a lot of thought put into it at a high level. I hope my proposal was an improvement on this. I like the idea of a modern city in the middle of the play area that then becomes more run down as you head to the edge. The high quality accommodation should contrast with the shacks that people are forced to live in on the outskirts. Finally, the plot holes. Fallout 4 has a fair few of these. My story probably does as well. It's hard to identify all the plot holes until you develop the story a bit more, so I'm not going to pretend I've solved this problem. And that's it. Did anyone manage to follow all that? Overall, I believe a story like the one I've outlined in this video has much more potential than another hunt for a lost family member quest, while offering a little more science fiction to get stuck into than New Vegas did. The outline in my proposed version of Fallout 5 is simple. In the first act, your protagonist gets funneled into a route or faction of your choosing. 
In the first half of the second act up to the midpoint you are earning the loyalty of your faction or opting to join a splinter group within the faction. In the second half of the second act you are preparing for the finale. In the third act you choose sides in the big fight and determine the fate of those on earth. Coming up with an outline is a tiny part of the overall process. The writing in New Vegas is great not because of its high level premise but because of the dialogue options and responses you get as you talk to other characters in the story. A Save the Family Member story can be perfectly compelling if you have talented writers. However, I suspect the writers who come up with the lazy story ideas are the same ones charged with writing the dialogue and as a result you're left with the mess that is Fallout 4. I'm not sure how many people will make it this far into what probably appears quite a self-indulgent video, however if you have then hopefully you found it vaguely interesting. I couldn't think of another way to talk about Fallout 4 without repeating what other people more talented than me have already said. This idea for Fallout 5 kept popping up in my head and I figured that talking through my own story idea might be a good way to illustrate the problems with Fallout 4's story instead of just talking about them. Or maybe this has been an incoherent mess, it's honestly hard for me to tell. If you like this then it's probably worth checking out my Mass Effect Andromeda video where I do a similar thing. There's timestamps in the description so you can skip to that part of the video. Anyway, thanks for watching and or listening. The next video should be a full blown critique on the evil within. I'm hoping to get that out this month but it's always tough for me to predict these things. As always, liking and sharing is much appreciated. Please subscribe if you want to see more critiques and hit the bell icon if you want a notification when I post a new video. There's usually one a month but sometimes I do silly things like this and squeeze out a second video. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this video and the story idea I outlined. Feel free to suggest changes or tell me what doesn't work like I did with Fallout 4. Oh and follow me on Twitter because my follower count directly dictates my self worth as a person and it needs a boost. Cheers.